Tolabenjirasanjirubaraisho <coughs> Om ye dharma hetu prabhavam hetu tesham dathagato hevatat tesham chayo nirodam evam vati mahasramana yesva Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetu tesham dathagato hevatat tesham chayo nirodam evam vati mahasramana yesva Om ye dharma <coughs> prabhavam hetum tesham tathagato yavatat tesham chayo nirodam evam vati mahasramana yesva all phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata, the cessation of the causes as well as taught by the Diyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasam gade bodhi swatyata om gade gade paragade parasam gade bodhi swatyata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswatyata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Swaha <coughs> Okay, um, the uh, compassion and um, the in the Manasi universities such as the big monastic universities, such as Sera, Debung, Ganden. The, and the tradition has it that the, um, this is very beautiful, the benefit of the Bodhicitta. Um, what I would suggest is that the, um, before I talk about the, the practice in the monastic universities, uh, for us who, but the, for us, once in a while you can uh, read Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, chapter, chapter 1. Chapter 1, which is extremely, um, the, very inspiring to see the benefit of general Bodhicitta, chapter 1. And um, that, and particularly when you sit for retreats, personal retreats, um, the Lamrim retreat, or Bodhicitta retreat, and um, for even for retreats, 
say the yes, of course, some people they can sit for like um, the one month retreat, two months retreat, three months retreat, and so forth. But most of us we don't have time. And the earlier I used to get a little bit of time f of like the say one month, two months, and so forth. So nowadays I don't get time. And thanks to COVID, because of COVID, that that my engagement with the outside world okay here, uh, we did not meet the last two years, and also that the in, even in Delhi, I had to go for many programs like conferences, meetings, and so forth. All these things cut down, and because of which I got more time. Of course, the uh, in terms of teachings, it simply increased number uh, number wise. It, uh, it increased in the number uh, because of the online teachings. It simply increased in number. But the uh, say so oftentimes traveling, even within Delhi, traveling, the say the it takes time. So with the COVID, since you don't have to travel, all you just sit next to, to your laptop. And it saves a lot of time. So relatively, I got more time during the, the two months, two years. And I was very happy, glad that the, um, the, I got more time to do my personal practice. So, uh, the, so when you talk about the personal practice uh, or retreats, it's not, don't just wait for, okay, one day I will, um, the, uh, the, uh, I'll finish my work. And then I'll, I will retire, I'll resign, and then I'll sit for, say, the continuous for retreats. Don't expect like this. So what to do now? Because a fresh brain and a fresh mind is required for the retreats, for the meditation, particularly wisdom of emptiness. Um, bodhicitta, the, yes, of course, we should be very creative, and even the creativity and so forth, we can train ourselves for the wisdom of emptiness, of course, the mind should be extremely fresh. The mind of the, the, the young mind is required. Of course, I have now white hairs coming here and there. And the, it doesn't mean that the, you have white hairs, now you hope your time is finished. There's another point. Um, believe it or not, I, I hope you all agree with me. You are the youngest of the lifespan that you are left now. Do you agree with me or not? You're the youngest of the life center you have you are left now. You are the youngest today. Yes, no. Yes. 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 Use this use this youngest day of your remaining part of life. Use this. And for that matter, it is uh, the uh, don't wait for, you know, some other days in the future. So whenever you get like long weekend or two, say two day, uh, two day weekend, three days weekend, which we call as long weekend. You sit for retreat, and even if you have just one day, one day retreat, do it and make it a habit. And when you sit for retreat, one day retreat, two day retreats, what you can do is that you, particularly those people who are very close to you, who may wonder what happened, know what's up today from this from this person. And uh, that you inform that person in advance. I'm sitting from person. I'm doing personal retreat for one day, two days, and they don't expect any message from me. And then the others is fine. Just so those who really who are concerned about you, you inform them advance the in advance that you are sitting for retreat. And just sit for one two day retreat. That's fine. This is how we build the habit. And for retreat, it's very strange sitting for retreat. Um, initially, even for you uh, to feel settled in the retreat, your timetable of the day, even that seems to be not just started, not just not adjusted, not settled. You, it takes time for you to uh, to go into flow of the retreat. It takes time. You have to do perhaps like, for example, if you are to sit for. A one month retreat, two month retreats, like two or three times you have to sit. Only then the, you will feel that, okay, now this is the flow. Then you get a flow and 
you can flow beautifully although still at that point somehow you are something doing new not adjusted you feel tired somehow you will not find the flow once you find the flow then it's very easy for you so to find the flow it takes time it requires time for you for that matter just start to do the retreat like get up early in the morning like say if you do one day retreat two day retreat three day retreat then get up early in the morning like say five o'clock and then start from 5 36 so this is what we can do and um, they don't have to give the label retreat right in your mind this retreat but for other people are just having good time yeah say this keep it very low profile it's so important what do you do particularly I say for them sometimes I do share my the not experience but what I do I share with you I share with the, the people who you know the who I encourage who I teach I share otherwise the idea is that you are not supposed to share your spiritual how uh, the practices what do you do you are not to share these things with other people share meaning that or oh, this is what I do it is as well like the say this is a great hindrance impediment for your growth and it's pretty based spirituality because that is uh, the same subcon what what uh, the uh, Freud call as the subconscious or what in Buddhist psychology known as the very subtle imprints of the ego gets activated very subtle imprint of the ego gets activated when you try to say that yes I do this I do this you know so that we have to keep them very low profile if you really want to uh, say the take the speed or the seed success of your practice this is so important for example if i go to my teacher i don't know how many of you know her about you heard about gelam and the maybe yes the uh, venerable and anyone else gelam and yeah uh, there are two one is from the tibet and one is from india so the one that I'm referring to is from the one in India who passed away many years ago. If you go to his hermitage, he he was a lifelong retreatant. Go to your hermitage, you will never see anything about I say the Vajra Bell or anything about Tantra. You will never see him. You will just think that he is just practicing like single part meditation like this, but is a great practitioner of uh, Shri Kala Chakra Tantra. And you will never find any item related to Shri Kala Chakra in his hermitage. You will never find anything. Everything is maintained very confidential. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that the, the retreat you can do. And uh, don't just wait for a time. In Kuru Master, I'm telling you, and I should be, uh, so the, I have little excuse, right? So the, nowadays, more and more teachings happening, and then the, I don't know, the body-wise, maybe it's the old age, I feel more tired than the earlier days. In the earlier days, people say that you have so much energy. Now, I don't feel that as much. Yeah, I feel tired. Okay. Uh, so this is one thing. So with this my what I'm saying is that you can sit for just if you're doing one two day retreat, you can just specialize on empty the let's say impermanence, just merit impermanence, and the reflection that you did in the I say the uh, the impermanence after the retreat you try to flow with it, you try to have the flow. Meaning that when you go out, remember impermanence. Remember impermanence. When you work, remember impermanence. When you hear something, then for example, okay, now somebody's sick, somebody's ill, cancer, death, so forth. Remember, yes, this is how the world is telling me that we are impermanent phenomena. So, like with suffering, in fact, impermanence and suffering, these two will go together. These two practices will go together. 2019, what is that? 1989 or 1989, 1990. 1990, 89, I think. 
Yeah, when I first set for my very amateur basic meditation, Kailam Nambarimachi and said that I was not at all, not at all exposed to emptiness, but it is nothing. It was just the first year introduction into the Manchester University where we spent a lot of time in creating the, the basics like logic and so forth. And then, but I was so keen so was, uh, to sit for a retreat. And I asked permission of Kenan Lamberbuchi. And he said, Yes, you met with impermanence. And the, yes, I did chess on these two for two months. And of course, this very blessed uh, blessing of His Holiness and uh, my teachers and Kalam Rinpoche. It was a great thing. Uh, so what I'm saying is that you can sit for retreat just for impermanence, just on the suffering nature. There's also some samsaric nature, three kinds of sufferings. And then you can also think about the rarity of the human life. You can think about it, the emptiness. Once the, you're exposed to emptiness well, then the so the other parts of the lamrim you do it very quickly and then spend more time in emptiness and with the bodhicitta again spend more time in bodhicitta just going through the step by step step by step step one two three four and not missing the steps so with this um the you will come across where you get stuck once you know where you get stuck sometimes you get stuck Sometimes uh, the, you really feel the, the, the challenges. Sometimes you know the steps so well, the, there's a flow in the steps, but experience-wise, is nothing is happening. You may feel as well like it's so dry, intellectual, say, the, the repetition of these steps. You may feel that. When that happens, then you have to consult your teachers or say your Dhamma friends, somebody who is senior and you can feel, particularly you can feel that somebody is actually practicing these. You can feel it because the uh, same, the, how the person talks from there, nuances are there. What do you the practice that you do and where you get stuck, where you don't feel anything, the person talks in the the flow of the, the words. You can feel that the person is actually experiencing and has experienced it. You can feel that. These things are there. So once you identify these, then you seek the help. You know, not necessarily help. Uh, just share your thoughts that it has become so mechanical now. The what to be done? What to be done? And the, particularly if you have someone as your guide, as your teacher, then they must uh, they seek advice from the teachers that this is what is happening now. I get stuck here, no experiences are coming. Many of the people who attended the Bodhijita retreats, earlier we had did the Bodhijita retreat twice here. So those who did the Bodhijita retreat um, the, in various places here, in Bodhgaya, in Deer Park, in uh, South India, in Malaysia, in uh, the Jambi, where Lama Selingpa was. So we, and then Israel, we did the, oh, Ben, you did not attend the Bodhijit retreat in Israel. Okay, so the, um, what I'm saying is that um, many of these people, to sitting together for about like 10, 15 days. Many, many people are inspired and they, they continue to do the practice, Bodhicitta, which is four seals and so forth. And some of them after a while, after a few months, perhaps in some case one year, they would report to me that uh, the now it has become so earlier, the experience was quite intense. You just feel like crying. You feel, you say, your emotional transformation or emotional movement is have taken place. So over time, it has become very mechanical. Now, nothing of this kind happens. So where I'm getting stuck. So these th these experiences, you this is, this is how we ha have to go through. Everybody has to go through this. That some some experience at some point some experience then it becomes mechanical then you become more say the expert so initially the progress is like this shooting up like this like a shooting star then it will go down and become flat become flat and then if you study more 
if you seek the help of you know your teacher, study more, then it will go up. Once you go up, it's not like uh, the rocket. This it is very diagonal. It's very flat, but still rising. That is very stable, very stable. Other the, the early one is a sudden rise. That's not stable. It's not stable. Uh, but it's very precious and the, the second phase of the rise so there is not like very sharp is diagonally rising and that's extremely stable so then you will get their condition you will start to feel that okay now my mind is expanding you will feel this okay this is so precious so uh, when we do particularly when we do meditation uh, the body uh, retreat on put exclusively on bodhicitta then reading chapter one every day is very important. Reading chapter one. Chapter one it will inspire you. And then there are of course other chapters they are very important, but for you to you know, within a short span of time you get a lot of information to inspire you would be chapter one. Okay. Uh, this is it. So in the monastic universities, in the monastic university it's a very beautiful practice. Say uh, the the monks. How many of you have seen the the monks debating? Raise hands. Good. Nowadays, not only monks, also the nuns, right? And in the big monastic universities, say the say uh, the in the debate courtyard, it starts from the junior most to the senior most on the other side. So the junior most, you go there. The people who are not exposed to this debate, they may feel scared that there's literally this are fighting happening there. The junior ones, everybody wants to prove their points. Yeah, and then as you go to the higher and higher, more 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 senior, to the senior most you see there, you will see an extremely profound calmness there. Everybody's enjoying. Everybody's enjoying. You could see that. The, there's a profound discussion going there, but everybody there's tremendous calmness in their mind. You could feel it. Okay, so they, they, and they particularly in the big debate where all the monks are involved, like a thousand, two thousand monks involved there on special occasions. Then the those people who are sitting for the final Geshe degree, they have to sit, defend the positions, and the rest of the monks will throw questions to them. So when that happens, not only this monks, even the abbots and the historians and the Tirupuche and all these, the very senior abbots, they're also there to, to throw questions against you. So you have to defend the position. And the top ranking geishas are there to throw questions to you. So this says, and then the debates can go on from like, let's say that, that is on some of the special occasions when these, the, the new geishas are sitting for their final exams. It can go like, uh, the, say from after the evening, 7 o'clock till like, in some cases, 1 o'clock, 1 a.m. It can go like this, in between, tea will be served, but debate will continue. When we know that debate will stop. Okay. So there so that the flow is there, junior must do the uh, the class will put forth a question. Then after about like one hour, then next class, next class, next class, which means keeps going more and more senior. And then the around like one o'clock, one a.m. Then suddenly the disciplinarian may, may ask a junior monk. A junior monk stands up and then, okay, this may be the indication to stop the debate. The debate is coming to an end. And the junior one may start this, like, you know, how to start the debate. You, ju you just formally, you just start with a line or start with a verse. And if the verse is like such like this, this verse is very commonly a set in the Manash universities and you will this would be this amazing for some that even word is um Sirkyuzi Namba Chwada Bu Mizan Lutilani Kiwi Gu Rinjini Nam Mibu Gubi Nashi Ju Simshe Chawara Din Sung So the Tibetan word is the the it is in, in the English the rough translation is like uh the Sirkyuzi Namba Chwada Mizan 
having obtained this very defiled body, yet like the gold-making elixir, if it transforms the body, special mind of yours, to the, the splendid body, the body, special mind of the Buddhas. And this gold making elixir, which is the Bodhisattva, holds it dear to heart. This is the, the verse. And if the monk, if the young monk, junior monk, the starts with it, the, starts the debate with this verse, then all the monks they now come to know that okay, now the debate is coming to an end. So always the debate ends with a very auspicious verses. So this verse is a verse of auspiciousness about the bodhicitta, benefit bodhicitta. Then what happens? All the monks. So whatever the verse the monks said, for some of this verse, the gold, the bodhicitta is like the gold making elixir to transform your impure body to the divine body, the Buddhas. When that is said, it's all the monks will, you know, earlier they were reflecting, they were discussing, they were thinking about the points. And then this verse is said, all the monks will instantly take their own time and space, will sit properly and then, put, and then go into meditation. They will all, almost all will go into the meditation, just to reflect on the bodhicitta. And they will spend like few minutes on this, just go into meditation on the bodhicitta. And it's so beautiful environment. Okay, uh, so bodhicitta is so precious. And how many of you wholeheartedly feel that I want to have the maximum happiness results? <laughs> okay, how many of you are serious with it, resent? <laughs> how many are serious with wanting to have the maximum happiness? Okay. Do you know what's the meaning of serious? The serious means that no matter what what takes me to do, I'll do it. This meaning of the seriousness. If this is what you want to do, you have to practice bodhicitta. Without this, this infinite happiness will never happen. This is so precious. Okay. So with this, the um, the bodhicitta, as explained yesterday, there were two methods. One is the uh, sinful cause of a method, and the other one is the equalizing exchange method. And today I'm going to, uh, the earlier I thought of just explaining it by giving the gist, uh, but, but since that we do have little time, and we already laid some ground um, yesterday, so the uh, I think this would be uh, good to do it more formally. And... Um, Okay, two things that I'd like to share with you. The wings, the two wings of the bird to cross the ocean of samsara, cross the ocean of the two metal defilements towards Buddhahood. The two wings, one is the wing of the wisdom and the other is the wing of the wisdom, the compassion or the bodhicitta, the method in the wisdom. And the method primarily the bodhicitta. Um, this is very important. And the, these two, the, the great masters in the monastic universities. What they say is that for the wisdom, it requires a lot of studies. It requires a lot of studies and reflection. And then the, uh, once you have adequate amble of studies and reflection, then experience-wise, it will come to you suddenly. It will come to you very sudden. Once the reflection, the say the studies, study your study of the emptiness and the reflection of emptiness is done pretty well, then experience will come very quick. This is what the great masters say. But for the bodhicitta is very different. That you understand what bodhicitta is, it will not take time. If we have time, if we are exclusively doing bodhicitta, just bodhicitta, if uh, say the you are ready. And the, if the teacher is also well exposed to this tradition, then it will take like one week, not even one week. In some cases, like two, three days, Bodhicitta teaching can successfully be done. And of course, for expanding your knowledge, you have to read more materials to build up on this. Otherwise, it's just about like three, four, five, maximum six days. In six days, you will get a good understanding of what Bodhicitta is. But... 
you get a good picture of what bodhicitta is, but experience-wise, it will take time. This is the difference. For the emptiness, study and reflection will take a lot of time, and once you have that, experience will not take time. It will come to you like this. Where bodhicitta, study and reflection, you will have it very quickly done, and experience will take time. And sometimes it can be very demoralizing that, okay, nothing is happening. You should look, you know, say the, so sometimes this is what I used to think. For example, in for the, the bodhicitta, unconditional love, the way your mind feels flows towards all the beings. And I try to practice it on a daily basis. But in her day-to-day life, you see there are mind, there's a, a, a huge knots, one or the other, there in your mind. You could feel it. Your mind does not flow, it gets stuck there, you could feel it. So how, you know, is it really the case that your mind can flow freely to all beings? And uh, the, who are those people whose mind really flows to all the beings? Where? Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I've never seen them. Right? This is a huge challenge. And whereas, if you, you are very fortunate, if you do come across some people, it's very rare though. Very, very rare though. In my life, say the, uh, there are only, I've met thousands and thousands of people, but only few, three, four, five people in my life, I saw that, oh, they, these must be the real yogis. Not among the, with the, the, the labels, you know, big, big, big shots, no. About the ordinary monks, only, but very few. Wow, that's amazing. So that, if you, if you meet such people, you are very fortunate. Then you will get a conviction that this is possible. Look at this person. This is possible. You will feel it. So the uh, but the point is that you must have the eyes to see that. You must have the eyes to see that, to see the 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 virus microbes, the and the bacteria. You need to have the the that microscope. With the microscope, without microscope, you cannot see that. You must have the eyes to see who are the people who have who are very involved in the practice. You must have these eyes. So once you see that, you are very fortunate. If you do identify one or two people, and uh, say for example, this is what I notice in my life. Say, when you don't meet a person, you hear the, the good things about a person, you get a very good impression of the person. When you meet and when you actually you know, they interact with the person like on a day, day-to-day basis, then you start to see that, no, the person is not as, you know, the, 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 the impression that I got is not really there. But there are few, only few people who really gives you a feeling of, oh, wow, this is Bodhicitta. For some Gilam number machine. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so, what he used to do was that he was just a the hermit. He was a hermit in the mountains. And uh, the, he did not have any the fixed uh, resource for his living. But whatever little that he has, and the his the hermitage is just at, on the hill, and down there we have the school from where I was graduated. The say this small school, that refugee school, and uh, then the, the school during my time when Gyanamichi was the the, the hermit, the, sitting as a solitary retreatant. Then the school, most of the children they were all very poor, very poor like myself, very poor. And then the, uh, the whatever little money that he has when he goes to do shopping, groceries, then he will also buy sweets. Sweets. And he would have like uh, the very interesting, like say the red cloth apron. In the apron he would give, you know, all the stuff that he bought for the small children. 
the sweets all will go into the apron and he will come like this. And then the, the school children during the class class hours, the school children when in the playground, he would go there and give every one a one sweet each. It's so beautiful practice. All the school children simply loved him. Loved him. There's such a glow there. And then you won't believe. When he was in his retreat hut, you meet him, he was just a simple monk. Just a simple monk. There's nothing radiance there. But when you see him in public, there's a radiance there. You won't believe. And initially I thought that it was like the it was my bias that he's my teacher. I have so much respect for him. It must be that made me to feel him as radiant, just outstanding, standing out from uh, the, the crowd. And later on, the, um, the so this is how I the shared with you. When was that? Two days ago. That Richard Gere and my father. What is this? My father is more handsome than uh, the Richard Gere. My father is more handsome. And everybody's crazy after him. That was when he was in his 20s. When he was in the peak of his career. Where everybody's talking about Richard Gere, Richard Gere. And we in the school, we did not even know how to say Richard Gere. We said Richard Gere. It was it is G E R E, Gary, Richard Gary. Everybody say Richard Gary, Richard Gary. Just working, they going after him, and he happened to come to visit. He happened to come to our school, and everybody's going there. I thought that, that what is it? Richard? Everybody's just crazy. He must be very special. I also run run with them to see what he was like. Just ordinary person. So why he's so special? Oh, he's the Hollywood star. Oh, my father is much more handsome than him. <laughs> and later on, my aunt, my aunt said that your father, including your father, there were seven siblings. I know that. Of the seven siblings, your father was the ugliest. This was what my aunt said. And then I realized it must be my projection. Because I love him so much that I see him out, just standing out from the crowd and is so handsome. It's all seeing my father in the light of great endearment, which is so beautiful appearance. So this this was what I thought that I'm projecting my mind, projecting on my teacher. And later my friends said, said the same thing. Who is that teacher? And I said, what is it? why? I said that he's very different. Just from the crowd, he just stands out. As something very different. Who is he? Uh, then I will say that, yeah, be, if you want to meet him, we can go together to meet him. Then this is what many people said is out of the, this love. When you have really start to feel this love and affection towards others, same, the glow comes to you. This is so precious. Okay. So it says that. This bodhicitta is like gold making elixir. So where you have some useless metals, you the, put this the gold making elixir to all these useless metals and these metals will turn into gold. Are you going to dump these gold now? No, they are so precious, they are gold. Earlier you were going to dump them, but now, no, they are so precious. So what makes this so precious is the gold making elixir. So, gold mega elixir, how precious it is. Yes, it is so precious. Likewise, with the other beings, the body, speech and mind that we have, they are all, look at this body. This body easily gets hungry, feels thirsty. 40 degree is a heat wave. In Delhi, it's normal. Right? And for, oh, there's a heat wave. Kishila, be careful. What? Careful. 40 is so pleasant for me. <laughs> Right? So this is our body. Our body cannot take the 40 degree centigrade heat wave. And then the cold is so cold, we need a heating system. This, this. We need a heating system in cold. Look at this body. Right? Believe it or not, almost like minimum 80% of what you earn, they are for this body, just to sustain this body. Yet this body is prone to sickness, aging, death, tension, all these and medical insurances. Everything is for this body. Right? Body. So look. 
in this body, however much you do, it becomes older, older, older. It doesn't become more and more beautiful. Right? When I was seven years old, I remember my hands are so beautiful. Now it's so terrible, I don't look at it. <laughs> yeah, this is what, is, what happens. Yeah, this, you've been so kind to the body, but it becomes worse, worse, worse. <laughs> this is a body. And the speech. Look at the speech. Right? So most likely, in the Dharma centers, when you come to the Dharma centers, they're nice. Because you set your mind. And people, you know, they're frustrated at home, they're frustrated at the workplace. Come to the Dharma center, people set their mind, okay, I should put the chitta, <laughs> emptiness, fossils, impermanence, I remember the teachers, environment, stupa, guru and sambhava, and so forth. Your mind as it at it peace and calm. When you go home, you're very different. And what you say is very different, right? And the intentionally, unintentionally, our voice, our speech creates so much a problem. Intentionally, unintentionally. So look at this, the quality of a speech. And the mind is worse. Our mind is worse, right? Monday morning, your mind is like this. And Friday, but Friday evening, you might be so excited, right? So the and then the some how are you, right? Are you my doctor? Look, your mind is so agitated, seeing everything is everything so negative, right? Right? When did you come? Am I not allowed to come? Right? And say when are you going? You want me to go? Our mind projects things to others. This is is so defiled a mind. And then coming to the property among the siblings, the property so forth. So much of fights happening. So much of fights happening. Being so judgmental, right? So this is what is mind. And the say so we are very unhappy. So the point is that, whereas, is this your true nature, your body like this, or your body so weak, so fragile, and your speech, like a, they say, like a tones, can easily create problems, create the, uh, say, fights with other people, your mind, so uneasy, so unhappy, and being extremely poisonous. So this is, but this is not your true nature. Your true nature is so beautiful. But how can we make it, you know, make it, this true nature come out? Just apply this gold making elixir to this impure body, impure speech, impure mind. And this will make your body so pure, the body of the Buddhas. Where you don't rely on any external food. No matter what external situation is, your body will never be affected. Your body can freely move into every atom of the universe. And these are not stories. These are not fairy, fairy tales. These are the reality. And you, you see how the mind works how the mind works, the true nature of the mind, then you will see the power of the mind. Your, this is the power of your mind. And your speech, extremely appealing. Anybody hears your speech, your voice, your speech, anybody, they, feel, they start to feel healing. That's amazing. When somebody is so loving to you, when you go through the, the you know, very, very rough time, of your life, you hear that person's voice, you can feel the healing. How many, how many of you have that experience with hands? When you hear the voice of somebody who really loves you to take care of you, when you hear that person's voice, you just feel like crying, you feel just healing, you can feel the healing. Okay, this is what becomes when the bodhicitta is activated. And your mind, say the example that I gave you earlier, Say, for example, when you don't love the person, when you don't like the, the other person, anything the other person does, you see something wrong there. 
anything the person does. Say, if I the if I put this flower, so nice, there. What? Only one flower? <laughs> only. In this world, there's only one flower, <laughs> right? And then you two, two, uh, two, uh, put two flowers, then should it be all disciplined? It should it be very disciplined in the, in the, why should, why can't it be outside also? If we put it outside, don't you know that it goes in this, in this glass? You don't know where it should be, be kept? <laughs> With the water, don't you know that it will fall? Right, so the water can spill? If there's no water, you don't you know that that it'll die if you don't put the water? <laughs> Whatever you do, there's a problem. Whereas, if you love, if there's genuine love and affection, whatever the other person does is so beautiful. One flower, oh, that's cute. <laughs> I thought that always there should be two, three, four flowers. One flower is even beautiful. <laughs> two flowers, wow, that's nice. With water, oh, you're very thoughtful. Without water, yes, you are very thoughtful because the water will not spill. That's amazing. And the flowers outside, oh, that's also nice, aesthetic. <laughs> that's also very good. Wow, amazing. Whatever you do is beautiful. With the bodhicitta, that's amazing. Right? Okay, so with this in the mind, the, this is truly what makes you happy. And particularly when you learn how to uh, the feel the compassion towards the difficult people and the neutral people, that's amazing. Then you will start to see the pain of others. Otherwise, usually you don't see the pain of others. When you don't feel this compassion, you don't feel the pain of others. Particular people who are nasty, you are, there's a veil. There's, um, say, the uh, there's a wall between you and the other person that you that stops you from seeing the other person's difficulties. Whereas the moment you start to feel the pain of other, you 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 start to feel this love and affection flowing towards other beings, particularly difficult people. So even though the person very difficult person, but you can see the pain of the other person. More difficult the person, more nasty the person, more the person has the problems. This is a reality. You will see this and your compassion becomes even more stronger. Okay, so this is a beautiful practice and if you really want to feel this, uh, initially you have to have a little bit of, you need to sacrifice a little bit, sacrifice meaning that you have to spend time, you have to invest time on this practice and it will take time. Of course, he'll take, there's no way, there's no other way. Don't expect some gurus come to you, bless you, and then suddenly tomorrow you have the bodhicitta. It's impossible, impossible. So we just live in the illusion. We think that, you know, they, without any effort, somebody comes to you, bless you, and then you have the, uh, you will have the bodhicitta the next day. You have the wisdom emptiness next day. Impossible. So the proof that I can share with you is that that if you recite Om Arabhasanadi, Om Arabhasanadi, what is Om Arabhasanadi? It's the mantra of? Aramanjushri. Aramanjushri. Who is Aramanjushri? Buddha of wisdom. Buddha of wisdom. Bodhisattva of wisdom. Buddha of wisdom according to Tantra. Bodhisattva of wisdom according to Sutra system. Wisdom. Okay, I need wisdom to become Nobel laureate in physics. I recited hundred thousand times, hundred thousand times into 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 X amount for like twenty years. Don't expect to become a Nobel laureate in physics. Hundred percent guaranteed. You cannot become a Nobel laureate in physics if you don't physics if you don't learn physics. Instead, of recite, keep reciting mantra. Oh, Marabasand, Marabasand. Don't expect to become a Nobel laureate in physics. Don't expect that. So. The, this applies, the same thing applies to the wisdom of emptiness. Same thing applies to the bodhicitta. You put effort, you put effort in the systematic studies and then recite Om Nadi, then recite Om Mani Peme Hum, the Buddha of Compassion. Recite these to invoke the blessings. Then you will see the effect. 
without putting the effort yourself, without putting effort, and then without the Petra, who is the cook? Patricia. 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 Without Patricia, if you said, may the food be delicious, may the food be delicious, <laughs> food will never be delicious. But well, first, Petra, the Patricia has to work there. You know, <laughs> somebody should be cooking there, and then you pray. Okay, Buddha Shaikh, please have the, the meal more delicious, right? Uh, then they, they, it is nuanced miracles can happen. Otherwise, nobody's working in the education, right? Everybody, <laughs> it is not possible. Okay, so what I'm saying is that we have to practice systematic practice for this. Uh, the and yes, the it'll take time. It's not easy. And I may give you the feeling as to like, if I practice uh, within two, three years time, I'll generate bodhicitta. You may get this feeling when I inspire people like this. But in reality, when you go, when you actually walk, it will take time. Five years, ten years, it'll take time. I would not say twenty years, then you will not do it. Right? <laughs> Uh, say the it'll take time, it'll take time. Keep doing it, keep doing it. And uh, often they say initially it's all superficial, it's all superficial. At times you may feel that oh, what I'm doing is so superficial, this is not really coming true from my heart. This, how, this is the only way. This is how all these enlightened beings they went through. Initially, they struggled, struggled with the superficial thing. May I become Buddha for the benefit of human beings? The deep inside, your heart is just no, right? But just challenge your, say, the your instinctive thinking, which is so selfish. But uh, keep challenging it. Keep challenging it. Grab some time, you see that it's expanding. Where otherwise, in my experience, for example, there was one person, now the person already passed away, there was one person, and it was a big, 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 big problem for me since my childhood. Then the, I joined the, the monastery, and the, since the first year I was trying to practice, I, I was practicing bodhicitta. Although I was not at all, I did not have any information about bodhicitta, I was and so forth, I tried to learn it. Because my class was so beginner that the bodhicitta class was to be happening only after like three or four years. And I was struggling, studying on, the, on my own, then the same, uh, at paying attention to the, the teachings his son was giving, and so forth, and doing my own practice. And then say, remember all beings of one's mothers, remember recalling their kindness, being their kindness, uh, seeing the beings light of great affection, great compassion, altruism, and then Bodhisattva, may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. When that point comes, then except for this person. <laughs> except for this person, right? That is naturally coming to me. When you say except for this person, it's not Bodhisattva. It's not Bodhisattva. All your efforts gone, all your efforts gone in vain. It's not Bodhisattva. Then I said, oh no, this is wrong. So all my the, the practice goes in, in vain. So again, struggle, struggle, struggle. After several years, then the, the feeling of, say, the uneasiness towards that person gradually disappeared. Gradually disappeared. And the person, believe it or not, the person was actually a difficult person. Not only to me, to many people. Then over time, over time, I say, the, when people come to me and they, they are talk, the discussion goes around that person, then the other person there's such a feeling of the uneasiness towards that person. Then my mind I started to feel empathy towards that person. When you when I start to hear other people talking badly of this person, empathy flows. Then at times I defend the person. Not that, you know, oh, I'm practicing Dharma, so I have to do that. So, although I don't like it, I have to do it. No, naturally it is happening. Okay, I don't want to say, share more beyond that point. What I'm saying is that if you practice, 
change is bound to be there. You will succeed. It'll take time. No matter what, keep in mind that this is how all the past Buddhas went through. So, it's not that you are one who is so the incompetent that the experience is not coming. No, it's with all the past enlightened masters that this happened. You practice, it became, you know, no experience coming to you, it becomes so dry and a waste of time, you feel demoralized. Yes, these things happen. And under such situation, reading the biography, biographies of the past masters, great masters, that is very inspiring. Okay, and you have to meet your teachers to discuss these matters. Okay, good. Uh, so the, uh, today I like to um, do, since that, more the, I'll say, the word, in a, more in a very casual way. I already shared with some important points. I will go through the, the method of equalizing the exchange itself for others. This is so important. And then, once that is done, then we switch to aid versus mind training. Okay. Method of equalizing the exchange itself for others. So this is what is, what you find, uh, let's say, the uh, taught, the in the text, if you look for where this, the, the sources, the, what are the sources or where this is available, you see uh, they are available in the Arit Nagarjuna's text. And more exclusively you find in Bodhisattva Shanti Deva's text, Guide to the Bodhisattva of Life, Chapter 8. And Chapter 8, the title of which is Meditation. But Chapter 8, the title is Meditation. The first half of the chapter you will see about creating the conducive factors conducive factors for your meditation conducive environment and what should be your mindset like what should be the environment like so that is explained in the first half and creating the conducive environment for yourself mentally as well as outside then the, then Bodhisattva Shantideva said what to practice once that is set then you have to practice the equalizing and exchange yourself for others. In other words, bodhicitta. So there should be practice. This is what you find in chapter 8. Then the whole detailed explanation of the method of the equalizing exchange of others is taught. But how we, what we have now, we have the nine steps. And don't expect that in the Guide to the Buddhist of Self Life, chapter 8, you will see these nine steps there. Or step one, two, three. No, you will see them as the let's say the is scattered here and there. But the the great Tibetan masters, great Tibetan masters, they put them in the bullet points. Nine steps is very helpful for us. So in a meditation, we just follow through these steps and try to feel the experience, try to feel the 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 experience, feel that, and then you keep moving to the next. But don't wait till the, you get a very satisfactory experience with the, the first step. Don't wait till that point in order to move to the second point. Even though you may not get too much of but say cognitively, you said, yes, that's very true. Then you can move to the second. And then the same, over time, like the after a few months, one or two years, then not only that, it is very true, there should be some feeling coming to you. So that must come. If that is not coming, then every time it's just pure cognitive exercise, then it does not really benefit. So find this cognitive, uh, the cognitive transformation, conviction must be, gain, must be there, and alongside that the gradually this feeling should keep increasing, keep increasing, keep increasing. Okay, so nine steps. The first one is equalizing self and others. The first step is equalizing self and others. Number two is the, the uh, reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Reflecting on the demerits of cherishing oneself. Number three is reflecting on the merits of the cherishing others. Then number four and five is Tonglen. Number four and five is Donglin. Number four is the taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion. Taking the suffering of others with the emphasis on compassion. William, you need a pen?
You're looking for a pen? Okay. Um, number four. Number four is taking the suffering of others with emphasis on compassion or great compassion. Then number five, giving your happiness to others with the emphasis on loving kindness. Giving your happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. And the next is the actual exchange of self and others. Number six. Number seven. Special recollection of the kindness of others. Number seven, the special recollection of the kindness of others. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Okay, let me say this again. No, what is number one? Equalizing self and others. Number two, oh. reflecting on the demerits of cherishing one, cherishing self. Number three. Reflecting on the merits of cherishing others. Number four and five together, Tonglen. Number four is taking the suffering of others with the emphasis on compassion. Taking the suffering of others with the emphasis on compassion. Number four. Number five, giving your happiness to others with the emphasis on loving kindness. Then number six, actual exchange of self and others. Actual exchange of self and others. Number six. Number seven. A special, re special recollection of the kindness of others. A special recollection of the kindness of others. Number eight, altruism. Number nine, bodhicitta. Okay. Now the, we need to have these <laughs> actual exchange of seven others. Actual exchange of seven others. <clears throat> okay, we need to first we need to have these uh, points on our fingertips, and then, if possible, during the meditation, uh, when you sit for the meditation, don't look at the notes. Without referring to the notes, it must be in your mind. It must be in your mind all the steps, and there's going to be flow. Okay, uh, the first, equalizing self and others. Uh, we see that the um, in order to climb the, the roof, or in order to climb the roof, you cannot jump, you'll fall. So you need steps. Steps. Likewise, finally the job is, may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. I love all the sentient beings. Before that, the, so when you said all the sentient beings, then the what happened to this young boy? Me, when I was a very young boy, age like 19 or 20. So there, then except for this person, all these will come to you if we are not tactful. So there should be steps. Steps, because the moment you jump there, oh, that is a good place. From this you can see the whole Paris. If you jump there, you'll fall, and then you don't feel like moving there anymore. So we need skills to make sure that we go there steadily and the in a systematic way with the steps. So the first step is uh, to say the first step is to see that we are all equal. Not that you are more important, that I take care of you more. Instead of that, we are equal. This is the first step. Once we see that we are equal, then you are more important than me. That will come later. Otherwise, on the this uh, teaching, or say the equalizing, exchanging self for others, this is considered as the to be maintained confidential, not to be exposed too much, not to be revealed too much to the other people who are not familiar with this practice. This is what the Buddhist Sanchanti very clearly indicated that uh, the. They engage in the, this confidential practice of equalizing the exchange itself for others. This is what Bodhisattva Shantideva said. Sangin Dhamma Jebracha. This is the, what Bodhisattva Shantideva said. That the, uh, because the ordinary people, when they speak about, or at times, we are being so kind to us other people, some people, they think that, what's wrong with you? You know? What's wrong with you? Take care of yourself. Everybody will take care of 
take care of themselves. And then they, if the person does not know you so well, the person will think that you are a very stupid person. Right? You are a very stupid person. Not taking care of yourself, taking care of others. This is where the ordinary people cannot digest what you are doing. What you are doing is actually so wise, which the ordinary people cannot imagine the benefit of this. Because of which, they will feel repulsive to what you're doing. So this practice is what the Buddhist Shantideva advised us to keep it as confidential. Confidential, not to reveal it too much. Only when the person, other person is receptive, then you share these thoughts. Otherwise not. So what happened was that in Israel, in Israel there's one, one of my friends who is a psychologist and psychotherapist. His experience of Tibetan Buddhism. <clears throat> what he said was that um, he went to. It was his first experience in Dharamsala and in LTWA, Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. Um, he saw that there was one teacher giving teachings to foreigners. And he, um, he heard the teacher said that, that, say, Cherishing others is the the best thing that you can do. And he thought, oh, it must be a slip of tongue. It must be a slip of tongue because cherishing others cannot be the best. It's so unwise. You have to cherish yourself. According to Charles Darwin. Okay, it must be left on. And then he was just sitting there and the teacher continues to talk about it, continues to talk about it, and then concluded. Before he stopped the class, he concluded by saying that, therefore, benefiting others, cherishing others, is the wisest thing for you to do. That is of greatest benefit to you. And he said, for sure, it is not still tongue. It is his wrong idea. His teacher is wrong. He doesn't know the reality. So after teaching, he followed the teacher. And said that, sir, you said that cherishing others is the best thing for you to do. And the sir said, yes. I said, that, I don't agree with you. <laughs> and the teacher said, that, who are you? He said, I'm a, the psychotherapist. I'm a psychotherapist. This is my job. To give therapy to other people. This is my living. And the teacher was so happy. He invited him to the teacher's place and start, you know, he gave tea and he started to give a special lecture to this person every day, like one hour every day. And this person today, his, the teacher passed away. Unfortunately, the teacher passed away. Today, you mention the teacher's name to him, he just feel, he just, you will see that he's going to tears. And in, in, his, in his mobile, the picture is just his teacher's picture. He said, this is my teacher who changed me. Yeah. And yes, this teacher is very special. So maybe the Elizabeth knows, um, Geshe, um, Geshe Sunam Rinjala. No? Oh, yeah, Gishu Sunam Rinchenla. Yeah, Gishu on the before him. Yes. And that is a very special teacher. I really, wow, that's amazing. He's again one teacher who, I did not receive any teaching from him. I did not get the, any teaching from him, but I got the opportunity to sit next to him when I was a student in IBD and he was invited as examiner. And I could see the warmth from him. It's so special. Okay. Um, the, so, the point is that the, so this teaching is advised to be maintained confidential from the people who are not exposed to this teaching on compassion, universal compassion. That we need to keep in mind. So the first one is equalizing self and others. Um, the essay, um, the, our basic, our basic, if you look at the basic instincts, uh, Charles Darwin. Okay, anybody from the biology background over the year? Okay, two, three, oath. Okay, see, one time I was in America. 
with Professor Poligman, uh, who was a world-renowned psycholo- psychologist, particularly the pioneer of the microfacial expression reading, Professor Poligman, and I was working with him for five days <coughs> on a book of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which His Holiness and Professor Poligman were co-authoring. And I was sent there to book on the book by the Office of His Holiness to see that His Holiness' voice is well reflected there. And uh, the, for five, I was there for five days, and the one evening, every evening, he entertained me so well. One evening, he uh, brought his colleagues, psychologists, to meet with me. We had a sharing. And uh, the, he asked me to share something about Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist psychology. So I, I talked about, you know, how to create fearlessness, infinite and so forth, by transforming emotions to remove the attachment, anger, jealousy, fear and so forth. And one psychologist raised a hand, said that, but it's not possible. All these emotions like attachment, anger, jealousy, fear, they are all instincts. These are the evolutionary gifts of the evolution. You cannot remove them. These are instincts. Oh, to the Patrick, you're there. You didn't raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. So the um, these are all instincts. You cannot get rid of them. And more so, without these, without these emotions, you cannot survive. You have to survive. The whole purpose is to survive and the species to survive. This whole purpose. So without these emotions, you cannot survive. For example, say, without fear. If the tiger comes, you will not run. If you don't have fear, then the tiger will eat you up, finished. So you cannot survive. Likewise, attachment is to gather the factors required for your living. Anger is to get rid of the, the factors which are not conducive to your living. So this is how you have to survive. Gather the conducive factors and get rid of the non-conducive factors, which are done effectively by attachment and aversion, and the fear to run away from the threats. So without this you will not, you cannot survive. Okay, this is what she said. So with this, the point is that the um, the point is that these emotions are considered as the, say, intrinsic within the mind, as instinct within the mind. Whereas the, for Buddha, this is very different. We, we can call them instinct, because you see, in, the, in Buddhist terminology, or in Buddhist psychology, we, instead of instinct, we call them as innate. Innate emotions, emotions which are there within you since the, the time of birth. It doesn't mean that they're intrinsically there. These two are different. The, intrins- the emotions as intrinsic and emotions as innate, these two are different. Say, your attachment, anger, jealousy, since the, the time of birth, look at small children. They demonstrate, you know, for example, like the crying crime because of the cold, hunger and so forth. It's because of the you know, the is not wanting not wanting the aversion towards these unpleasant feelings. These are innate. Nobody taught the child in this life. And if we ask, where did you come from? From the past life. We are also expert in these from our past lives. We brought these in this life. Likewise the attachment, we brought this from our past life. Nobody taught us in this life. These are known as innate, but not in, but not. This can be instinct, but not intrinsic. Intrinsic meaning you cannot separate them. These become inalienable part of your mind. If they become inalienable part of mind, you can you cannot do anything to get rid of these. Yet we can remove these. So therefore, they are not intrinsic. They are innate, and we call we can call them instinct. Okay. Um, but the uh, there's a step. The first step that we take is how to mitigate the power of that. How to mitigate the power of the the, the selfish interests, the, the selfishness. For this, um, what is so important for us, Buddhist practice, whatever you do, 
Let's say the Tonglin practice, some people they, they emphasize on Tonglin practice, There's some people emphasize on the remember all beings of one's mother, some people they emphasize on the uh, the equalizing exchange method. Whatever you do, the say the crux, the essence of practice should be to see the demerits of the self centered attitude. And to see the benefit of cherishing others. This is the essence, this is the quintessential of the Bodhisattva practice. To see the demerits of the self centered attitude and to see the uh, the merits of cherishing others. This is a job. Whatever you do. And the sevenfold method and the nine steps of the equalizing exchange method will help us systematically uh, to see the demerits of cherishing, the demerits of the steps and the attitude, or the viciousness of this steps and the attitude, and the merit of benefit of cherishing others. This will the very skillfully take us to that realization. Okay. Um, the same. The first step, equalizing certain others. If you look at a mind, how a mind ranks. If you look at how a mind ranks, we see that a mind always thinks of the self as the most important thing. A self is most important. Even you know the uh, the some people who are extremely kind. Otherwise, when they when they um, when they are trapped or when they get into a situation. Uh, where there's a choice between yours and others, you'll go for yours. This is what you find in with uh, the people who otherwise are seen as very kind. So, very rarely, if you do find some people under any situation where the person cherishes others more than the self, is what you see, this must be the indication that this person practiced Bodhisattva in the past life. Otherwise, what we call as generally kind person. Kind person, yes, the person very kind. For example, my father, he's a very kind person. He will always try to stay away from creating conflicts with other people. But I know him so well. Of course, in his past life, he didn't practice Bodhisattva. But he's very kind. By normal standard, he's very kind, of course, very gentle, but everybody would, you know, respect him. But the, this systematic practice he doesn't do, that's for sure. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that simply because that somebody is very kind in general, doesn't mean that the, the person has the bodhicitta practice. No. Bodhicitta practice is very different. Experience that you get from the bodhicitta practice is very different. So for the matter, it is our job to the, observe your own mind, observe your mind, how your mind reacts. For example, how many of you have had the, the how many of you had the experience of taking a flight, is hands? In your life, at this once. Okay. Same taking flight and then the flight lands. Paris. Orly? Right? Yes, but two airports. All the airport, the flight lands. Flight, duck, duck, duck. Then the flight takes taxi. Right? Flight, uh, the, the airplane, then and look at all the people. They are in hurry. <laughs> <laughs> then they, um, then the flight get to the bay, the place where the, what is that? The passage. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what is that? Oh, the technical term, I forgot it. No, no. No, the, uh, it's the, the, so from the aeroplane then you get into the, huh? Okay, uh, so, when that's connected, then the air hostess will press a button to ting. Ting means now you can get up. Look at the passengers. Everybody gets up. <laughs> right? Gets up. And they, if somebody gets up and go before you, the person will stare at you. <laughs> no, that's not allowed. Right? The person will stare at you. And everybody hurries up. Right, make sure that 
you get faster. <laughs> and where, where you end up, you end up in the baggage claim. In the baggage claim, you don't know. Your baggage comes first or last, we, didn't, we never know. Right? You got there first, think that you got your home early, but you may come last. <laughs> right? This is how our mind behaves. I should come first. I should go first. I'm, what is that? I am more important than you. We will not say this, but this is what is happening in your mind. This is how our mind behaves. First, this one. I say the self-centered attitude. This is what destroys us. This is what destroys our peace of mind. This is extremely evil. Extremely evil. So, the whole purpose of this practice, all the seven methods, seven, the nine steps, is to see how, how, how vicious, how cunning, how harmful this self-centered attitude is. This uh, job. So the first step is, so the, you, your mind can actually, you know, say that when you do this practice, you can actually commit the, so this self-centered attitude, literally you can feel that it is actually talking to you. Talking to you and it's still like it is defending you. And actually this is one which destroys you, destroys your peace of mind. So the first step, how to undermine this? First step is to suppress it. Suppress this self-centered attitude. And then get rid of this. So how to suppress this? As first said that yes, self-centered attitude. So you which makes me feel that I am more important than others. I'm more important than others. First you have to say no to this. So for this, first we have to intellectually know how I'm not more important than others. First, we have to intellectually know. You have to remind ourselves of this intellectually. And then experientially, then experientially on a day-to-day basis, on a day-to-day basis, um, try to apply this to see, and to see how you observe your mind constantly, to see how the mind, how your mind will say that, I have to go first, I have to, I have to get this first, and so forth. So there, you try to Hold, your, hold yourself back a little bit with the compassion for others. Although the compassion is not coming naturally, but force yourself a little bit to say no to this self and attitude. But the first one, cognitive recognition that, that I'm not more important than others. This is so important. Okay. Let's say that if the... Okay, it's already 10.30. We'll stop here. We'll come back at eleven. Right? Huh? Deta Om Gate Gate Bada Gate Bada Sam Gate Bodhi Swahatya Om Gate Gate Bada Gate Bada Sam Gate Bodhi Swahatya Om Gate Gate Bada Gate Bada Sam Gate Bodhi Swahatya Ta Om Gate Gate Bada Gate Bada Sam Gate Bodhi Swahatya 